Okay, well, it's 6.30 and I think we have a quorum, so let's do a roll call. All right, uh, when I call your jurisdiction, if you'll please state your name. San Mateo County. Uh, Dave Pine. Thank you, San Mateo County. Atherton. Rick DeGolia. Belmont. Brisbane. Pauline Mackin. Burling Game. Donna Colson. Colma. Daly City. East Palo Alto. Foster City. Sam Hindi. Half Moon Bay. RV Rarback. Hillsboro. Larry May. Los Banos. Menlo Park. Betsy Nash. Milbray. Andrews Funk. Pacifica. Tiger Jazz Trolls Big Stick. Portola Valley. Redwood City. San Bruno. Jeff Alves. Marty Bedina for San Bruno. Thank you. San Carlos. Laura Palmer Lohan. San Mateo. Rick Bonilla. South San Francisco. Woodside. Jen Wall. Director Meritus. Pradeep Gupta. Director Meritus. And we have a quorum. Uh, East Palo Alto is present. Portola Valley is also present. I'm not sure if you heard me. Uh, and, yes. And, and Hillsborough. Hillsborough is present too. Okay, great. Welcome everybody to the July PCE board meeting. Uh, is there any public comment? If you have public comment, you can click the reactions button on your screen and raise your hand. And I don't see, and this is public comment for items that are not on the agenda. Chair uh, Yes. I do want to direct the board's attention to a public comment that we received via email uh, from Eric Brooks, which is available on the Peninsula Clean Energy agenda page for the Board of Directors meetings. Okay, great. Thank you, Nellie. Okay, I don't see any additional public comment, so uh, let's move forward. Can I get a motion to set the agenda and approve the consent items? Chair DeGoyen? Yes, Colleen. I, I would. I have a question on consent item number four. Okay. Why, why don't you go ahead with that before we move forward? Okay. Just a very simple question. I know in the past, uh, this program has been administered by Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition, but thinking about who might benefit from this program, have we actually investigated what they are doing for an outreach program? Because my concern is within some underserved communities and low income um, actively employed people, they might really benefit from this. And I'm just wondering if the outreach from Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition is reaching those particular segments of the population versus I know bike, bike shops are involved, but these are all people who are into bikes. So an e-bike is like a new toy. Are we reaching people who might use it actively as transportation to get to and from work? Uh, through the chair, I'm happy to answer the question. Please. Uh, Director Mackin, thank you for uh, for the question. And uh, we probably could have been clearer in our materials, but um, we do uh, uh, have a relationship with the S Silicon Valley Bike Coalition. They are providing some outreach, but it is not the principal outreach for the program. The principal outreach is by Peninsula Clean Energy directly, as well as through our other out. Um, outreach partners that include a number of uh, low income uh, uh, community partners. Um, most of our direct outreach is actually working directly with affordable housing organizations. Um, so directly to residents who live in 100% affordable housing, as well as our direct outreach um, by email and in community um, uh, uh, organizations such as El Concilio and our direct outreach is specifically to um, uh, residents who are on the low income care rates. Um, so we are very specifically targeting uh, community members who are, um, uh, you know, would be uh, most appropriate for this uh, program, which is income qualified. 
And thank you very much for that response. I, I'm very reassured to hear that. Thank you. Chair, uh, Tiger Jess. Thank you, Chair. Um, following on to Director Mackin's comment, I was actually having a discussion with a friend of mine a couple of days ago. Um, and I was letting her know the program existed. I had read about it in the packet and um, it was fresh on my mind. What I wasn't reading for while I was reading was um, when we might be continuing it again. So Mr. Riz, after I make my comment, if you might comment on that, that would be helpful. But um, she had looked and seen that the program was over, but now at least it's in her mind. Meanwhile, she's somebody who is served by the Pacifica Resource Center. As a former board member of the Resource Center, I'm aware that there was uh, some level of partnership between PCE and the PRC at some point. Not sure if it's still there, but I'm aware of that connection. Um, but PRC seemed to not be aware of the program when she asked whomever her caseworker was at least about it mm. today or yesterday. Okay. Um, so I kind of just wanted to follow on to that comment with that and um, ask by extension, if and when uh, the wait list will be open again at some point and when probably it would be, presumably when we authorize more funds accordingly. Uh, thank you. And with regards to um, uh, future rounds for the, this program, um, we have been thinking that this could be an annual program. Uh, there's certainly been uh, a, a lot of demand uh, and naturally, it would be at the discretion of the board, um, but we have been envisioning bringing this back um, for another cycle next year. Awesome. Thank you. And with regards to the Pacifica Resource Center, I, I, uh, I, I will check with the marketing team um, that has been coordinating with our outreach partners uh, on this. We have a number of outreach partners and uh, uh, I believe the Pacific Coast Resource Center has been one that we have been coordinating with, but there may, may have been a communication gap somewhere. And so we'll, we'll check on that. Sure. And it just, you know, naturally sparks the question in my head, how are the core agencies? Because that seems to be low hanging fruit. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, is there any other uh, question or comment from anyone on the board regarding any of the consent items and it, i don't see any is there any public comment regarding any of the consent items mr chair i make a motion to approve second and who where's the second i didn't laura from san carlos great thank you laura okay we have a motion and a second could we please do a roll call okay san mateo county Yes. San Mateo County? Yes. Atherton? Oh, yes. Belmont? I believe she's here. Oh, no. No, uh, I, I, I think that uh, Director Mates is out. Yes. Uh, Brisbane, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Burlingame? Yes. Colma? Daly City? East Palo Alto? Yes. Foster City? Yes. Half Moon Bay? Yes. Hillsboro? Yes. Los Banos? Menlo Park? Yes. Millbrae? Yes. Pacifica? Yes. Portola Valley? Yes. Redwood City? San Bruno? Yes. San Carlos? Yes. San Mateo? Yes. South San Francisco and Woodside. Yes. Thank you. The motion passes. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so the next item on the agenda, uh, moving into the regular agenda is the chair report. I, I really don't have anything substantive other than to welcome everyone <laughs> to the meeting uh, and just to comment that uh, for the first time in two and a half years, my wife and I were able to travel uh, over the last month. We, we spent three weeks in Ireland. It was wonderful. I talked to a lot of people about what PCE is doing. They're very focused on energy. Uh, 
in Europe, and I experienced that in Ireland. Uh, I hope everybody else gets a chance to get out and uh, get away for a few days. Um, I don't have anything else to report. The next item on the agenda is the CEO report. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I uh, hope everyone's doing well and staying as healthy as you can. If we go to the first slide, please. Um, so I would like to welcome our new CFO, Christina Eligar Cordero. She started on Monday and she's here with us tonight. And I'd like to invite Christina to say hello to the board and introduce herself. Hi, everybody. Christina Eligar Cordero. I am pleased to meet everybody and um, look forward to working with everyone uh, on the board. Uh, started this week and um, it's been a, a great uh, first week. Thank you, Christina. You'll all get to know her better as, as time goes by. Um, next slide, please. Um, so hiring updates. So we have filled three of our open positions. Uh, Joe Ficalora will be our new Electric Vehicles Associate Programs Manager, and he will be starting on August 22nd. Jeff Wright will be our new Power Resources Manager starting on August 31st. And Moya Enright will be our new Senior Renewable Energy Analyst starting on September 1st. So you'll meet them uh, soon in the next couple of months. And if we can go to the next slide, um, we have four open positions, although actually we made an offer today which was verbally accepted for the Human Resources Manager. And if that all works out, um, that person will be starting on August 15th, which will be great because then uh, that person can, person can help onboard the other three hires that are starting later that month. Um, we are in the midst of um, interviews for the regulatory compliance analyst, um, still looking for more uh, good candidates for the director of power resources. And we just posted uh, the position for the strategic accounts manager. So again, if you have any leads or know of any good people, uh, please reach out to your networks and let them know that we have these positions open. Next slide, please. So we are in the process of doing update presentations at all of the city councils. So uh, Mark has been reaching out to your, um, to your city staff to get those set up. And we've done two so far. Um, I went uh, virtually to Half Moon Bay on June 21st and virtually to Daly City earlier this week. And we are, you know, we're very excited to see you and, and update your entire councils on what's going on here. And thank you to all of you who report out at your council meetings about what's going on at Peninsula Clean Energy. Uh, it's apparent that when we do go to these councils that people are aware of what's going on, so we greatly appreciate that. Um, but this also provides an opportunity for people to, to ask more detailed questions if they so choose. So um, we'll be seeing you soon. We've got a few more lined up uh, in the next couple of months. Next slide, please. Uh, no legislative update at this point because the legislature's on recess this month, um, although you probably have been seeing announcements coming from the governor. For example, he announced that he would like to see, I think, 10 gigawatts of offshore wind uh, built over the next 20 or so years and also support for decarbonization. So we're, um, we're excited about those, those things coming from Sacramento that support what we're trying to do although we're usually slightly ahead of what the state is doing. And next slide, please. So there are our upcoming meetings um, next, a week from Monday, we'll have our executive committee and uh, in a couple of weeks, our CAC meeting. The audit and finance committee meeting has been pushed out one week, which is why it is now listed as a special meeting on August 15th so that we can have all the numbers ready to report out on fourth quarter um, results. And then the board will be meeting again on August 25th. And I do want to remind everyone that our board retreat this year, which we always hold in September, will actually be on the Thursday night as opposed to the Saturday. So it will be on Thursday, September 22nd, our regular board meeting night, but it will start early at 5.30 
and go till 9.30. So we'll get our four hours in then, and we'll look forward to seeing all of you at that time. So I think we have a pretty full agenda tonight. I kept my report short and uh, happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. Great. Does anybody have a question? And I don't see it. Yeah, I, I had one comment I wanted to ask. Uh, Please. Okay. Uh, Jen, I read in the report about the right solar project, the storage component. Yes. And I was very disappointed because from the very beginning, uh, we, we were counting on right project to contain both our own solar generation as well as storage at the same site, uh, given all the transmission distribution hassles. So I was kind of disappointed and I was just wondering if that decision was made unilaterally from KKR uh, or is there any avenue left for us to revive that project? Um, we, along with you, were extremely disappointed as well, uh, Pradeep. Um, we'd been negotiating with them for two years on this and a lot of blood, sweat and tears went into that and we thought we had an agreement and then KKR is a hedge fund. They're just looking at the money and decided it wasn't going to provide the returns they wanted. Um, so they are planning to sell or they're interested in selling overall the right solar project. And so we hope that they will sell it and that they'll sell it to another party who is interested in adding the storage. The, the contract's done. You all saw it. You know, you all approved us signing it. We don't sign, we usually have the county counterparty sign first. So we asked them to sign first and they never signed it. So we're ready to go. Um, everything's defined there. And, um, you know, we're just hoping that there will be someone who, who comes in, purchases the overall project and understands the importance of adding storage to that project. So yeah, we're all very disappointed with that. Thank you, Jen. Okay. Uh uh, Donna. Thank you. Um, probably not something that could be answered right now, but I, I wonder, Jan, um, does it make sense for us to work directly with them and add the storage on ourselves? Well, I, yeah, I tried to explain in the, in the memo. So, so clean era, uh, they're the operator and the actual owner of the project um can't um well so clean air it would be interested in buying the project but there's a foreign owner that owns them and so they actually are not able to add the storage themselves so what needs to happen is that another party come in and build that uh, buy the solar project and then um not a foreign not a foreign entity and then um, the storage could be added to the project. So I, maybe we take this, take this offline, but to me, this is something where like maybe one of the, I know like some of the big California state pension funds are doing investing into clean energy, some things like that. So maybe there's, you know, a way to sort of facilitate that and, and you know, think about, how to do it. It's, it's not a conversation for today. It's just something right. we can maybe, we can think about and talk about maybe in finance committee or executive committee at, a, at another day. Yeah, so, so certainly going. we can take that. Happy to take it offline with you, Donna. Yeah. And brainstorm yeah. some ideas on who we might approach. Uh, Clean Era did say, you know, if we've got some ideas um, to let them know, and um, we can certainly try to find other purchasers for this project. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Just to follow up on that, if anybody on the board happens to have contact with KKR or any of the principals in KKR, you should let Jan know that might be a place that we could put some pressure on them. But I think at the end of the day, we need them to sell their interest and deal with another party. Yeah, what we heard is that KKR is actually wanting to exit the renewable energy field altogether. So they're going to be trying to sell a number of their assets in this uh, space. So, yeah, it's very disappointing. Hey, 
I, I don't see any other questions or comments. If anybody else has a question or if there's any public comment, please click the reactions button or actively wave your hand. I, I have a, a comment from Drew. Hello, I just out of this discussion, I was just curious and not trying to set policy, but could Peninsula Clean Energy actually own a generation source somewhere, be it solar, battery, wind power, thermal, whatever? Like, can Peninsula Clean Energy just generically own a source and generate the power instead of buying it from third parties? Just was wondering. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Jan can address that. We could. Um, that would be a, a, a more um, in-depth discussion that we would need to have with the board, but we could invest in our own generation projects. We haven't done that yet, but um, some other CCAs have. Um, I think Marin has uh, with their Richmond project, which is 10 megawatt project. So um, it's certainly something that we can we can look into. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair question. Just be aware, the MCE project is 10 megawatts. This is a 200 megawatt project, so it, it it's a big lift. But it's it's worth having a discussion of and at least reporting to the board on. I, I think it's a fair comment. Right. Are are there, are there any other comments or questions? Okay, not seeing any, uh, let's move on. The next item on the agenda is a report from the Citizens Advisory Committee. Uh, Cheryl, are you going to provide that? I am, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> yes, no I am. Problem. No problem. Okay, um, good evening, Chair DeGolia and honorable members of the board. At our July 14th meeting, we heard about two home electrification programs. Diane Bailey, CAC member and Menlo Spark Executive Director, announced Menlo Park's new public-private partnership with Block Power, a Brooklyn-based climate technology company that's screening American cities. Together, Block Power and Menlo Park will electrify buildings in the community, working toward the city's cap goal of carbon neutrality by 2030. Menlo Park City Council approved the partnership by passing a resolution after months of work by city officials and staff. And Betsy may wanna comment on this afterwards. Building decarbonization is a key part of Menlo Park's cap since burning fossil fuels in buildings produces 41% of city greenhouse gas emissions. Partnering with Black Power, the city plans to electrify 15 buildings this year in 2022 100 in 2023, and 1,000 or more each year in 2024 and beyond. Upgrades available through the voluntary program will include installation of heat pumps for air cooling, heating, and filtration, heat pump water heaters, EV charging stations, solar, battery storage, and other efficiency updates. Menlo Spark is working with the city to raise $35 million to reduce project costs for low to moderate income households. The program will focus first on the Bayfront, the neighborhood most impacted by climate change in Menlo Park. A related job training program will create local jobs and address the shortage of labor that's required to scale the program. Also that night, program manager Alejandro Posada talked about PCE's home upgrade program, providing no cost electric appliances, energy efficiency upgrades and home repairs to income qualified homeowners. She described the program as high touch with multiple contractors assessing work needed and performing upgrades. The program has updated 28 homes and has 45 projects in the works. Also at the meeting, KJ Janowski and Jerry Gotthail shared messaging research results and discussed plans for an upcoming electrification marketing campaign. CAC members signed up for each of five new working groups, two focused on building electrification. So those are off to a good start. And finally, the committee elected Jason Mendelson vice chair and me chair. 
Does anyone have a question for me? Or Betsy, would you like to comment about the Black Power Partnership? Thank you, Cheryl. Um, just we're extremely excited. Um, it is getting off the ground quickly. And um, this is a voluntary program to electrify homes in Menlo Park, as Cheryl said, focused on our most vulnerable community first. And we're very, very excited about the partnership. Any other questions about the rest of our report? So I have a, a question. Yes, Rick. Yeah, thank you. So I've been hearing some, um, actually a bit about this uh, Menlo Spark, Menlo Park, Block Power. And um, I know that the state has put in some money and, and I heard you say that the city is working with, uh, I forget who, oh, Menlo Spark to try and raise some more money. Right. Um, is the work gonna pay the prevailing wage, do we know? We are actually looking at that right now. Good, thank you very much, I appreciate that. Um, thank you. Thanks, Rick. Any other questions for the CAC? Okay. And is there any public comment on this matter? I don't see any questions or any public comment. Thank you then. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. Uh, and the next item on the agenda is an update on the diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion project. Great, thank you, Rick. Um, can everyone hear me? I think so, okay. Um, so I am Shana Barnes. I'm the project manager for our diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion project. I'd like to introduce our consultant, GCAP Services, who will be giving the first part of our presentation tonight, which is a general project overview. I will then supplement with some key takeaways from our survey and interviews that have been conducted um, earlier this year. So um, on the GCAP project team, we have Ed Salcedo, who is the president of GCAP services and co-lead on this project. We also have Brittany Yamagata on the line, who is a consultant with GCAP services. We also have Sharon Qualls, who is a senior consultant with GCAP services. And I believe Mara Rosales, who is a subcontractor and also co-lead for the engagement and, um, on the line as well. And she's, she is with Rosales Business Partners. So without further ado, I'll hand it off to, um, oh, I would like to hold all questions until the end of um, both GCAPs and my, my presentation. So um, in the interest of time, we will do, we'll take that approach. Um, Ed, would you like to, to kick us off for our presentation? Yes, great. Thank you, Shana. And uh, thank you for uh, introducing the team. I just want to confirm whether or not Rena was able to make it. Uh, is Rena on the line as well? Okay, I'm not yeah, hearing Yes, I, I am actually. I was okay. muted, my apologies. That's okay, am, go ahead. I okay. am here, hello everybody. I'll be driving so, the presentation, so. Okay, excellent. That, I was nervous about that. That's why I wanted to make sure you were on the line. So thank you. I, so I think um, I'll actually be moving the slides just to confirm. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. great. All right, Sh Shana, thank you so much. And uh, good evening, chair and board members. And as Shana mentioned, my name is Ed Salcedo. Um, and uh, today we're going to cover um, the diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion assessment project. Um, and the presentation today will be primarily to provide um, the board uh, an overview in the status of the DEAI project. Um, as Shana mentioned, we welcome your, your feedback. Uh, we are asking you to hold your questions. However, if you'd like to use your chat feature to queue up the questions, please feel free to do so. Uh, and we can uh, address those, we'll queue those up and address those at the end of both presentations. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide, Shana. So just a real quick um, agenda here. Uh, we plan to take about 15 minutes, so it'll be a brief presentation, but uh, we have you know, um, the time for you at, at the end for any questions. Um, the primary areas we're gonna focus on is uh, the foundation and uh, you know, talking a little bit about um, Peninsula Clean Energy's mission and then addressing these project tasks. So we'll go through this at a summary level and then we will uh, wrap up with the next steps. Where, you know, where do we go from here and then open up uh, the presentation for questions. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And I'm gonna go ahead and hand this over to Sharon Qualls. Sharon. Hi, everyone. Um, this we call the house chart. And 
what you see as the pillars are the strategic initiatives that are outlined in your strategic plan, and then PCE's mission on the top. And when we started out with this project with Shana and her project team, you could assume that DEAI would be one of the pillars, but we want to stress that DEAI or diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion needs to permeate throughout all of the strategic initiatives at PCE. So this is just um, a visual to help emphasize that, that DE, DEAI is the foundation to your strategic plan and to PCE achieving its mission statement. And then the next slide then. And um, this slide here basically outlines our methodology and it has the key steps within the process. And as you can see, each step builds on each of the prior steps. So we started out with the organizational assessment, which was a survey and then augmented with interviews. Then we conducted a DEAI legislative and regulatory analysis. And then we developed a, a a policy uh, statement for DEAI. We're in the process now of reviewing various organizational policies and documents. And ultimately our, our goal is to develop an action plan that will help PCE operationalize the work that we have done in this project. And um, each of these steps we're gonna cover in more detail. So I just wanted to give this as a, a visual of our, our roadmap for this project. And with that, you can go on to the next slide. Okay, thank you, Sharon. So uh, I believe all of you may have already um, looked at or at least been provided um, the survey report. Um, we, we work closely with Shana and her team to develop two separate surveys, uh, one uh, an internal survey for NENSA Clean Energy staff, and the other one an external survey for external stakeholders. Um, key observations um, were presented at the Citizens Advisory Committee back in May, uh, and we received some um, excellent feedback at that time. Um, one important finding or observation from those surveys is that NENSA Clean Energy uh, we found is, is ready to develop and implement uh, diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion measures to help improve uh, the organizational excellence at Peninsula Clean Energy. And, and this was made uh, very clear to us as we reviewed the survey um, results and the survey uh, responses. Next slide, please. Now, to, thank you, Shannon. To, to supplement the survey uh, and based on responses, we were able to select uh, multiple stakeholders from different groups uh, to conduct more in-depth interviews. The interviews provided us with another building block for the DEAI action plan, and we were able to identify some themes from those interviews, which are helping us um, identify actionable deliverables for that action plan. Themes include, as you can see here on the slides, um, your readiness, you know, how ready um, is Peninsula Clean Energy to move forward, um, talent management or, you know, human resources, um, communication, outreach, which uh, we found uh, some, some excellent um, feedback and observations based on, on both of those areas, and procurement or, you know, vendor management. So those are just a couple of areas that we were, were going to be touching on. Next slide, please. Uh, in addition to the, the interviews and the surveys, we also completed a legislative and regulatory review. Um, Mara Rosales uh, and I, both being licensed attorneys here in California, were responsible for completing the legislative and regulatory reviews. Um, those included Proposition 209, um, General Order 156, and Senate Bill 255, the Bradford Bill, which has now been incorporated into General Order 156. So we were also uh, we also reviewed various solicitation documents um, and uh, interviewed Peninsula Clean Energy staff, uh, including council, to better understand the documents uh, and get a better understanding overall uh, of those documents. Um, we've completed our review uh, and uh, we're currently 
Um, so we've submitted the draft report and we're currently awaiting feedback on the uh, legislative and regulatory report. Next slide. Please. And I'm gonna go ahead and hand it back to you, Sharon. Oops, um, operator error, sorry. Oops, there we go again, sorry. Um, okay, so we have um, submitted and today we received back um, feedback from PCE on our draft DEAI policy. And um, what's key that we wanna point out is that this policy that we developed integrates the elements that the, um, the CAC provided to PCE, and it also references um, policy 10, which is the sustainable workforce. It also includes um, feedback and insights that we gained from the interviews and um, industry best practices. And um, it's designed to communicate PCE's business priorities to not only internal staff, but to external stakeholders. And then um, you may have already heard workshops are in the planning and um, we want to meet with um, key internal stakeholders and, and the um, subcommittee and the CAC to get um, their input on this policy to make sure that it's um, understandable, um, communicates clearly what we want to communicate and covers all the important areas within the um, organization of PCE. And um, with that, the next slide. Okay, um, so here are the workshops. We'll be meeting with the, um, the CAC, PCE staff, and um, the DEAI subcommittee. And um, the two outputs that we wanna get from this is to finalize the policy, but also just as important is gaining alignment and support for this new policy, and then ultimately um, get board adoption um, later this summer. And next slide, please. Okay. Um, so organizational policy documents, we are in the process of reviewing um, some key documents within PCE, including employee handbook, the strategic plan, ethical vendor policy, and then the inclusive and sustainable workforce policy. And we did an initial review of these um, documents at the onset of this project, but now that we have done the assessment and once the policy is reviewed and um, approved by PCE, we wanna go back and make recommendations on these documents. Um, Ed mentioned that we are already working on some of the procurement and solicitation related documents. And um, ultimately we'll have recommendations on different policies and documents with the goal of actually updating for, for PCE. And next slide. Okay, Sharon, thank you. So the DEAI Action Plan will be Condensa Clean Energy's uh, roadmap to implement uh, actions, tools, policies. Um, you know, Sharon mentioned some of the revisions to the policies, but also practices. So, so this is your roadmap, as you can see here by this graphic. Um, what we're doing is we're incorporating what we've learned from the workshops, from the policy development, from the survey, the interviews. And, and the output is the action plan, right? It's your roadmap. Um, and in addition to that, um, we'll be looking at new and or revised policies uh, and the uh, various solicit solicitation documents as well. So uh, I wanted to, uh, let's go to the next slide. And I wanna just provide you with just kind of next steps where we go from here. Um, Sharon mentioned the workshops. We are going to be conducting those workshops here over the next month. Uh, we're going to be finalizing the policy, uh, and then we're going to be uh, completing the action plan. And this is a, a, a main lift. This is a big lift for us. This is really taking everything we've learned uh, through the assessment phase, and now we're going to be um, focused on the development phase of the action plan. 
Um, we also, again, Sharon mentioned the uh, update to the relevant pol PCE policies, uh, and that'll be happening. And uh, it's happening now, but it'll be happening uh, in more efforts in September and early October. And then finally, we're going to come back to this board uh, in October, sometime between October and December. I guess it depends on when we can get on your calendar uh, and um, present the overall assessment and the completion of the project back to this board. Um, so um, I believe now we're going to um, shift over to Shana to your presentation. And then after that, I believe we're going to be opening up the uh, presentation for questions. Shana. Correct. Thank you, Ed and Sharon. I will just scroll to my correct slides. Hold on one second. So um, I will be presenting on some key survey and interview takeaways, just diving a little bit deeper. Um, the full survey report and all of the appendices were included in your board packet tonight. Um, those have also been included, um, sent out to all staff. Um, so uh, the, those documents are now public. Um, I want to indicate that uh, we had two surveys, as Ed and the team mentioned. We had an internal survey and an external survey. The internal survey included staff and former staff, and the external survey included board members, CAC members, CBO contacts, outreach grantees, and other community contacts, and also program participants. So the survey and interview timeframe was between February and May 2022, starting off with the survey and then um, wrapping up with the interviews in May. The number of the surveys received were 151. That's a combination of both internal and external surveys. And the number of in-depth interviews were 13. Um, a number of these items that I'm going to share with you tonight, we are already um, working on. Uh, we, the survey and interviews also showed that we are doing pretty well in a lot of um, the EAI subject areas, but there is always room for growth and improvement. So we are happy that we had this needs assessment phase of the project to figure out the areas that we need to focus on. So in the area of human resources, staffing, and recruitment, we found that there is an opportunity to improve the diversity of PCE staff, particularly at the leadership level, to better reflect the diversity of the communities PCE serves, and include efforts to source better candidates better from underrepresented communities. We identified a need for a dedicated talent management and human resources function, which is something that we are working on with our verbal acceptance with the HR manager position that was announced earlier tonight, which we're very excited about. We also found that employees, board members, and committee members could benefit from diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion-focused training. In the area of programs, services, communication, and outreach, we found um, among both internal and external surveys that stakeholders found that the accessibility of PCE programs could be improved to, better, to provide easier and better access to all customer segments. There's an opportunity to improve awareness and communication regarding PCE's energy programs, especially among low-income and non-English speaking groups. We found through the um, interviews that PCE materials sh should be translated into different languages to improve accessibility. And we also found during the interviews that there's a suggestion to consider exploring additional communication channels like TV and radio to better reach target populations. Under the area of management, we found internal stakeholders which includes staff and former staff, believe that PCE's leadership provides opportunities for them to grow and advance in their career with PCE, regardless of their background. Um, PCE could improve on celebrating and encouraging diverse perspectives and understanding among staff. And PCE top management is receptive to DEAI initiatives, but needs more training and coaching on the topic. And I will wrap up here with um, our last survey takeaway slides. Um, in the area of procurement and vendor management, we found that we could consider ways to promote diversity and the involvement of women and minority owned businesses within our supply chain. And with regard to psychological safety and company culture at Peninsula Clean Energy, we found that employees largely agree that on their teams, they can have discussions regarding difficult and uncomfortable topics, which is very positive. We found that a few employees have experienced unwelcome comments or conduct at Peninsula Clean Energy that was offensive, embarrassing, or hurtful. And we found that DEAI specific training could be utilized to improve our company culture around diversity. So that um, summarizes the interview takeaways. If you have any questions on um, any specifics in the survey report, you could um, ask those now or also email me at sbarnes at peninsulacleanenergy.com. I'm happy to respond to any um, questions there as well if you have any on the survey report. But, um, with regards to the presentation, I'll open it up for questions from board members and the public. Thank you all.
Are there any questions from members of the board? Uh, Donna, and then Marty. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Um, thank you, Shana. Great summary. Um, so this week in the San Mateo Daily Journal, there was an interesting article about a group that I was unaware of um, called REACH, and it's a group that's encouraging um, sort of government affiliated, I think, organizations as well as individual candidates running for election to um, embrace DEAI perspectives and practices. And I thought it was really interesting because I'd never heard about it. And one of the things that they asked about was, um, would you like to be a REACH ally? And there's a questionnaire for um, organizations. I, I, I'm assuming PCE would hopefully qualify to um, apply for that uh, ally um, sort of designation. Um, but I just wanted to point it out, Shana, so that maybe we can do a little um, research on that. I know a couple of our members, I know Laura has been endorsed by them and some other, other people maybe in our, in our group here that are running for office currently. Um, but I think as an organization, it would be really, really nice to reach out to them and um, explain what we're doing, ask for any perspectives they might have on it and share the work we're doing and, you know, just see if we can get them to endorse, um, you know, the sort of approach that we're taking on this. So Thank it's really you, more that kind of a question. It's, it's more to, to something to the outside, but thanks, Shana. If, if we can do that, that would be great. And we can work on that in the subcommittee. That sounds like a great suggestion. I will, um, I wrote down their name. I'll do a little research with Kirsten here on the project team and um, we could potentially reach out to them and uh, I'll keep you apprised of what the conversations that we have with great. them. Great, I, I think James Coleman's on the board so you can reach out maybe through him. Okay, that's great, we have a connection. <laughs> okay, Marty. Yes, thank you for the report. Um, very, very interesting. Um, I'm a little concerned about the employees that felt like um, there were some embarrassing comments and, and so what is staff doing to kind of look into that and, and, and to, uh, to respond to these, these, uh, allegations. Great. So, um, we are considering additional training and diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion training. Um, and I think also our, with hiring the HR manager, we're hoping that they will assist with having like a centralized um, person where employees can come to with concerns. Um, we, we think that would be uh, an additional benefit of hiring an HR manager. Um, we did note down um, in the survey text responses that are not all open um, to the public, uh, what exactly those comments are. And we are taking that um, under um, consideration with, with PCE management and how best to address those. I'm not sure if Jan or Kirsten wants to add anything there, but. Yeah, I, I can add to that. Um, yeah, we're, we're aware of a, a couple of instances um, where some comments were made and we have had conversations with the employees and taken some follow-up action, but we are really glad to be bringing on an HR person who can help provide the training. And then as we implement the the DEAI um, process here to make everyone just more aware of the things that they say and the impact that that has on other people. So um, thank you for the question. No, no thank you for, for the answers. I feel much better that uh, as we're moving forward that uh, we could resolve these and it, it's all about um, the training and, the, and, and, and people really understanding what, what could be considered offensive. So um, thank you for this. Okay, thanks, Marty. Uh, Laura Palmer Lohan. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I appreciate this report and I appreciate the thoughtfulness and um, uh, the extensive uh, approach that's being taken with the DE and I. And I just wanted to, um, you know, suggest to maybe I'm a little bit premature because we're not at the comment stages that. You know, these conversations are very difficult and, um, you know, how they're facilitated uh, can uh, make or break uh, the environment. So 
Um, my hope is, is that there could be some consideration given to uh, really embracing this idea of psychological safety and, and making sure that um, everybody has the opportunity to be heard and seen um, from, you know, their point of view so that uh, healing can, can occur. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Laura. Okay, thank you. Uh, Giselle. Thank you, Rick. Um, great to hear about um, adding HR so that we can, you know, iron out some of these kinks uh, and, and continue to professionalize the organization. But I'm curious, um, how was it decided uh, to move forward with a, an FTE, a full-time employee, or to evaluate other models um, for a smaller sized organization, sometimes working with a group that has a variety of HR functions on staff can be really effective because, you know, we, you know, we may think of HR as one thing, but there's actually many specialties within HR. And so I'm just curious, Jan, and, and um, you know, of your new COO, you know, how you've thought about that, because even something like um, executing a DEAI strategy is is a specialty within HR and and may not be within the skill set of a, of an individual. Right. Um, thank you for the question. Yeah, we're we're about thirty five plus employees now, and as we keep growing, we find that we really do need to have someone who can uh, spend full time focusing on these types of issues as well as the myriad other other needs that we have, such as hiring and onboarding and benefits and salary surveys and proper evaluations. There's just a lot that we need to have done. So up till now, we have been using an outside firm, RGS. We have a contact there who's, who's been doing some work for us, but we find that that's really not, um, not serving our needs at this point as we've grown. And so it makes more sense to bring in someone, the person that we're that we've made the offer to, and who is accepted. And I'm not, I can't yet announce who that is, but um, brings great experience. And I think because of the ex experience they have, if they if they themselves do not have the particular expertise, I know that they have the networks to bring in the right person to to help us for any particular needs that we have. So. Um, I think you know we're we're at the stage now where we really need to uh, treat HR in a real professional manner manner and have it be a full time focus as opposed to the part time focus that it's been up till now. Okay, Thank you, great. Jan. Thank you, Jan. Is there any other comment or question from members of the board? Uh, let's see. Don't see, is there any public comment on this? Okay, I don't see any hands up. So we will move on to the next topic, which is uh, item number 11 to authorize the CEO to execute necessary agreements with California community power and participating community choice aggregators for two, um, Renewable Resources Projects. Uh, who's going to present that? Um, Rick, if I, if I could, I'd like to just say one thing more about the, the last report. Yeah, and great, really, go ahead. Yeah, to really thank Shana for digging in and um, you know doing this project, working closely with GCAP and for Kirsten for her support on this as well and her, her keen interest in this area. So they've done uh, a, a terrific job in really moving this project forward. Um, for this next item, uh, Chelsea Keys is going to be presenting and Chelsea has agreed to be our interim power resources director while we're in the process of, of doing a recruitment. So you'll be seeing more of, of Chelsea over the next few months <laughs> as we have a lot going on in the power procurement side. Yes, we do. Well, thank you, Jan. Can move on to the next slide. So first we'll start with our recommendation and what we're asking tonight is for you to delegate authority to the CEO to execute agreements with California Community Power and participating community choice aggregators for renewable resources with Ormat Nevada Inc. and Open Mountain Energy. 
So on the agenda, I'll talk a bit about the background. Then I'll remind you about our firm clean renewable requirement, which was set forth in the midterm reliability procurement mandate by the CPUC. We'll review the RFO results and I'll show you a summary of those. We'll go over the CC power contract structure and the exciting portion is about the geothermal projects. And then again, with our recommendation. So just a little bit on the background and the timeline of this procurement. It all started in June 2021 when the CPUC issued the midterm reliability procurement order. In October, CC Power issued a request for offer for firm clean resources. In December, the RFO offers were due. In January 2022, you may remember that the Peninsula Clean Energy Board approved agreements for tumbleweed to meet the long duration storage requirement. And then following that meeting, CC Power Board approved tumbleweed. So this was to meet a different uh, a subset of the procurement mandate. And then in February of 2022, CC Power shortlisted two geothermal developers from the RFO. Next slide. And then in May 26, at our regular May board meeting, PCE board approved a resolution delegating authority to CEO to vote on CC Power board, mem board items. And this allowed Jan the the ability to vote at that following meeting on May 31st at the CC Power meeting to approve these power purchase agreements with Ormat Nevada Inc. and Open Mountain Energy. And now following the execution of those PPAs, all the respective CCAs that participated are seeking their board, appro board approvals. Next slide. So this is just to highlight the midterm reliability procurement mandate. Some of you may be familiar with this already, but we'll walk through it. So again, it was issued by the CPUC in June 2021, and it's to address midterm reliability needs. It requires LSCs to collectively procure 11,500 megawatts of new resources. It's allocated by load share. Resources must be zero emission or RPS eligible. There's 4,500 megawatt requirement is subject to specific category requirements that we'll go over in the next slide. So this just goes over Peninsula Clean Energy, Energy's allocation of the procurement order. So we have a, a subset here of the requirements and the years in which they must be procured. So the geothermal resources that we're seeking your approval for tonight are gonna to meet the tranche that's for firm zero emitting resources. And we have a 19 megawatt requirement. And firm zero emitting resources are essentially generating resources that have at least 80% capacity factor with no use restrictions or weather dependencies. So the qualifying resources include geothermal, biomass and biogas. Next slide. So the effective load carrying capacity factors are essentially what's used to calculate the resource adequacy value of resources. Mm -hmm. The requirements set forth in the procurement mandate, like I showed you in the previous slide, are based on the net qualifying capacity of resources. So what we need to do is convert the net qualifying capacity to the nameplate equivalent to know how, much, how many megawatts we need to procure from a resource to meet the MQC. So the CPUC released a study in September to provide guidance on converting facility nameplate to net qualifying capacity. And what they found is that geothermal resources, they do have project specific characteristics and it can be dependent on their location. And it does make them susceptible to temperature-based D rates during the summer net peak conditions. So the CPUC suggested that we use the five to 10 PM forecasted output in September because they find this to be the peak reliability need hours. So what CC Power did is we took the 8760 generation profiles of the geothermal resources to calculate what the peak availability is of these resources during that 5 to 10 p.m. window in September. And the estimate we came up with is that for every one megawatt, we get roughly 82 to 87 megawatts, or sorry, 82 to 87 percent NQC. So what we're doing in this table below is just converting our 19 megawatt NQC allocation to a nameplate equivalent, which is 23 megawatts. So we need to procure 23 megawatts from resources. 
Next slide. So the RFO results summary, I'll go over that. So CC Power received offers from six developers, and this includes 16 projects. Only four of those projects were located in California. And one in particular uh, note to make is that most new geothermal capacity in California has already been developed. Um, and for it to meet our requirement, they must be new. So CC Power, after we received the offers, we ran an analytics model and conducted interviews. And our evaluation was based on first conforming with the MTR requirements. We looked at those that were the lowest price and they ranked higher up on our economic evaluation scale. They had to satisfy our workforce and environmental requirements that CC Power adopted. And we looked at appropriate delivery terms such as 20 years. So CC Power shortlisted projects from two developers, one project from Open Mountain Energy and a portfolio of projects with Ormat Nevada Inc. Next slide. So before we get into the projects themselves, I wanna remind you about the contract structure between us and CC Power. Next slide. So the overall structure is gonna be very similar to what we did on the tumbleweed agreement with CC Power. We start on the left-hand side, we got the geothermal project, which is with the developer. The developer has the power purchase agreement with CC Power. And then CC Power signs what's called a project participation share agreement with all of the eight participating CCAs. And then between CC Power and the eight CCAs, we also have this buyer liability pass-through agreement. If we go to the next slide, I'll go into the more details of these agreements. So essentially the agreements with CC Power are related to credit and collateral. So we have two different types of agreements. The buyer liability pass-through agreement is executed by the CCA, it's developer and CC Power. It basically just guarantees that each CCA is gonna perform and make their payment to CC Power under the PPA. There's no letters of credit or cash required of the CCAs. And in the project participation agreement, there is the 25, percent step up of cap. And this was something that we adopted in the last agreement with Tumbleweed. So we're mirroring what we did before. It essentially just commits that each CCA, if something happened like another off or another CCA defaulted or they didn't get their board approvals in these, these upcoming months, that each CCA would commit to take up to no more than 25% of their, their allocation. And then also within this is a three month payment obligation posting per CCA to CC Power, just to ensure that CC Power um, remains um, in good standing with their contract with the developers and can pay. Next slide. So now we get into the exciting details of the geothermal projects. Next slide. So first we'll go over Open Mountain Energy. I'm sorry, this slide got a little weird. Um, the seller is Fish Lake Geothermal. That will probably be the name of the project. The developer is Open Mountain Energy. The technology is incremental geothermal, just means that it's new. The project size is 13 megawatts. So PCE is gonna get a portion of that 13 megawatts. The product is bundled. It includes energy, PCC1 RECs, RA and ancillary services. This particular project is located in Esmeralda County, Nevada. The COD is projected for June 1st, 2024. The price is fixed, there's no escalation. It's a 20 year term. And then the scheduling coordinator will be the seller. Next slide. Oh boy, this one really cut off. <laughs> um, Shana, would you want me to share my screen really quick so they can read it? Our apologies. Okay, so for the ORMAT portfolio projects, the seller is ORMAT, the developer is also ORMAT. Technology is also incremental geothermal. This one is a bit different. We're not actually procuring a fixed quantity. We're procuring between 64 megawatts and 125. 
And the way that got constructed is that CC Power collectively, they we want 125 megawatts, but Ormat felt that they could only provide 64 megawatts because a lot of these projects are still in development and they just didn't want to overcommit. So what they're going to do is provide a minimum 64, but potentially up to a max of 125 because they do have transmission and capabilities to get to that. The product will be bundled, again, energy, uh, PCC1 RECs, RA, and ancillary services. The location, there's going to be various locations because there's multiple projects. Most of them will be in Nevada, but there'll also be one in California. The expected COD, they do vary by project, but will start as early as 2024. The price is fixed, again, no escalation. Term is 20 years, and the scheduling coordinator will be at the seller as well. All right, so I will stop sharing my screen. <laughs> okay, so just a little bit more details about Ormat's portfolio. So again, like I mentioned, they're gonna offer facilities as they become available up to 125 megawatts. The way it's structured is that CC Power may accept or reject a project within three months if either of us are unable to acquire import capability. And I will go over what that is in the next slide. Or if we can't get the import capability, we have the option of extending the COD uh, day for day until we are able to obtain import, import capability until late September of 2027. So facilities that are accepted by the CC Power members then become part of the portfolio. If we, ex if we reject a facility, then the minimum required amount offered is reduced by the reduced volume that we yeah. Next slide. So import capability. Essentially, it means that projects that don't reside in CAISO they need to acquire what they call import capability, and it's a process through KAISO to get this, to be able to deliver into California and to count that resource towards resource adequacy. And it's a requirement for the FCR procurement mandate because we need to be able to provide the RA. So all projects with the exception of one will require import capability. Because CC Power is not an LSC and it must be LSCs that request import capability, we all must go get the import capability on our own for these projects. For Open Mountain, we have two to three delivering points where we'll be able to get the import capability. For ORMAT, we have the option, but not the obligation to reject projects should we not be able to get enough import capability at the delivery points for the various projects uh, when they get uh, offered to us. Next slide. So now we'll go into the workforce. Since most of these projects are gonna be located in Nevada, CC Power is requiring that they either A, provide Nevada prevailing wages to workers, or B, apply to the renewable tax abatement program called RITA, which is a Nevada program. And within that program, it requires that 50% of the workforce be Nevada residents, that they pay the workforce no less than 175% of statewide annual average wages. And you can actually find this on the RITA website and provide health insurance that satisfies the requirements. So for ORMAT, who may develop projects in Imperial Valley, California, they will be provide, required to provide either a PLA or a California prevailing wages. For either project, if a PLA is not executed because they still have the option to provide a PLA, both developers have agreed to comply with an audit to demonstrate proof that prevailing wages are paid through a certified payroll system. Next slide. On the environmental, we evaluated their geospatial footprint for each project and found no impact to any federal, state, local, or other conservative designations or planning efforts. Projects are not located in any areas identified as not suitable for renewable development by Renewable Energy Transmission Initiative. Sellers also must obtain and maintain all permits required by the appropriate governing authorities, and developers will attest to not using forced labor in their supply chain. Next. 
So this is just a summary of the PCE project allocations. This just shows the geothermal contracts and how they meet our, our, our requirements. So if we start on the left, I show again our 19 megawatt MQC requirement, but I convert it to nameplate, which is roughly 23. For the ORMAP portfolio, PCE will receive 17.1% of that portfolio. But again, because of the minimum and maximum structure, it is guaranteed that we'll get the minimum, which is 10.9. But if ORMAT is able to deliver 125 megawatts, then the max we would receive is 21.31. For the Fish Lake project, we will get 17.8% of that project, which amounts to 2.3 megawatts of that 13 megawatt project. So over on the right-hand side, it shows our remaining obligation. And because we don't know yet what we will get from ORMAT, I show what our obligation will be if we get the minimum, which would be we'd still have 9.7 megawatts remaining, or if we receive the max allocation for more amount, we would be slightly over our requirement by 0.6 megawatts. Next slide. So this just shows all the participating member CCAs. There's eight of us, including Peninsula. And then below I show uh, Peninsula Clean Energy's allocation. It's similar to the prior slide, except it's showing the 25% step up that we're agreeing to in the project share agreement. So for the open mountain facility, we get the 2.3 megawatts, but we could potentially step up to 0.58. Or for the ORMAT nameplate, we're just showing the max that we could receive for ORMAT and then the max step up, which would be 5.3. And then the total step up altogether would be 5.9. Next slide. So our recommendation to reiterate to you is to delegate authority to execute agreements with California Community Power for renewable resources with ORMAT and Open Mountain Energy. So we're seeking your approval of the project participation share agreements and the buyer liability pass-through agreements with both projects. For ORMAT, we're seeking a 20-year delivery term on or about June 1st, 2024, dollar amount not to exceed 405 uh, million. And then for Open Mountain, delivery term of 20 years, starting on or about April 1st, 2024, not to exceed 41 million. And I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you, Chelsea. Yes. Uh, does anyone on the board have a question? I don't see any questions. Uh, Pradeep. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, uh, I just wanted to first uh, uh, highlight the importance of these kind of projects for our future clean energy uh, strategy, because these are the projects which provide firm capability to meet all our demand needs, irrespective of weather. And I wanted to highlight that fact that these, are, these two projects are very critical in our portfolio. And staff has done very well along with Jan and uh, CC Power to make those kind of resource come online. I have uh, two observations to make to the board just to draw their attention. And I did some rough calculation on the cost side and I'm not uh, privy to all the details of the contract, but uh, my mm -hmm. rough calculations show that in general, this kind of firm power or capacity will cost us twice as much as our normal wind and solar projects. So that fact has to be kept in mind that the uh, firm cap capability comes at a cost. And uh, basically it's, it's uh, twice as much as the other kind of capability. And I have one little concern, which is not a big concern, but one little concern with the Open Mountain Energy uh, Project, uh, in which when I read the report, it stated that in case uh, the project is not able to get Kaizo approval to import the power into California, we will not be able to get out of the project uh, agreement. Uh, and I don't know what will be the outcome in, in that uh, uh, situation, or where, uh, whether we'll be getting energy but not credit for the capacity or is there any other problem? 
And that's a question I might like to get some answers from the staff. Thank you. Yes, I'm happy to take that. So that that is accurate with the open mountain contract. It was constructed where it's it's the CCA's obligation to get that import capability to qualify the resource for resource adequacy. So if we are able to get that import capability, we will receive the energy, like you said, pretty, but we would potentially not receive the resource adequacy. So we'd still be paying for that. However, we've set up the contract so that there are different inner ties in which we can get the import capability. And our hope is that we'll be able to secure that because we have alternatives. Thank you. And, and Chelsea, um, could you please comment on, in the event that we don't get the maximum that uh, we could get under the ORMAT uh, project, where we would look to fulfill the remaining unfilled obligations that we've got for the firm energy? Yes, great question. So we have a 19 megawatt NQC requirement, which converts to about 23 megawatts nameplate, um, which we do have a couple of projects in negotiation that could potentially help meet that. But um, the Heber 2 project that we have uh, secured with ORMAT, that potentially will count. We're just still trying to get some clarification because that resource is partial repower. So it's not all the, the entire facility isn't technically completely new because part it was partially still there. But that we think at, th there's a good portion of that that will count towards our requirement. And when do you expect to get more settled on, on that? And when when is the uh, deadline for having uh, the firm power requirement satisfied? I believe the requirement, so it's in 2026. So we do have some time. However, we do have to show to the CPUC our progress before then, but it is 2026 in which the requirement is. Okay. Great, thanks. Uh, so are there any other questions uh, or comments from members of the board on these contracts and the request? I don't see any. Is there any public comment on this? Uh, wait. Uh, okay. I don't see any public comment, but Rick Benia has his hand up. Go ahead, Rick. There I am. Sorry. I just want to say that along with you, I was on the procurement committee when we looked at these projects. These projects are very advantageous for Peninsula Clean Energy in that they're going to go towards helping us meet our clean and firm energy goals, which are required by the state. But also the geothermal energy really goes a long way to help us with our 24-7 all renewable energy or all clean energy by 2025. So uh, meeting our goals in several different ways, these are important purchases and I support uh, 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 approving this. Thank you. Okay, um, I don't see any other comments or questions. Can I get a motion to approve? I make a motion to, to approve. Okay, thanks, Rick. Can I get a second? Second, Laura. Thank you, Laura. If we could do a roll call, that would be great. My handy chart wasn't readily available. Um, San Mateo County. Yes. Thank you. San Mateo County. Yes. Atherton. Yes. Belmont. Brisbane. Yes. Burling Game. Yes. Homa. Daly City. Yes. Thank you. East Palo Alto. Yes. Foster City. Yes. Half Moon Bay. Yes. Hillsboro. Yes. Los Banos. Menlo Park. Yes. Millbrae. 
Pacifica? Yes. Portola Valley? Yes. Redwood City? Yes. San Bruno? Yes. San Carlos? Yes. San Mateo? Yes. South San Francisco? Yes. Yeah. Woodside? Yes. And just wanting to circle back to Millbrae. Okay, uh, the motion passes, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. So the next item on the agenda is item 12, which is a summary of findings from annual awareness perception research. KJ will be making this uh, presentation. Good evening. I hope that I will be making this presentation because during most of Chelsea's presentation, I spent that time rebooting my modem and rebooting my router. So hopefully things will hang in there. I've already warned Jerry Godheil, who's on the call, that if we have another crash here at the Janowski residence, he'll have to take over. Um, but tonight I'm going to be presenting on two separate but highly interrelated topics. Um, the first is an update of our annual monitoring survey of awareness and perceptions of our brand. Um, and we have for the first time in the survey included Los Banos residents. So you'll see some differences, but you'll also see a lot of similarities uh, between the respondents from uh, San Mateo County and those from Los Banos. And then the second part of the presentation summarizes um, key findings from a separate research study that we did just of San Mateo County residents about home electrification. And I'll also be giving a little bit of an update of our progress to develop a campaign to promote electrification. Next slide, please. So tonight um, I'll be, um, so, so basically uh, this uh, uh, awareness and favorability measures are key metrics that we report in our strategic dashboard. So most of you have seen the strategic dashboard. We'll all be updating it at the strategic retreat. Um, but tonight um, I wanna talk about the uh, marketing part of this. And so you can see that the, um, there are two blank cells here in fiscal 22, the year that we just completed. One of those is about aided awareness. And aided awareness is, it refers to survey respondents who could recognize Peninsula Clean Energy from a list of electricity providers. Uh, and then favorability ratings are expressed as a percent of those who are aware. So of those who have indicated that they are aware can pick our name out of a list, what is their favorability rating? Is it somewhat or very favorable or something else? And so I'll be filling in those blanks for you tonight um, during this presentation. Next slide, please. So this describes our methodology. This is a, we took a random sample of all households in San Mateo County and Los Banos, not just customers, but in general um, residents. Um, we sent the invitation by way of a postal, postal mail letter. It was in English on one side, it was in Spanish on the other side. Uh, because we were also measuring unaided, or unaided awareness where we wanted people to spontaneously say whether they had heard of us, we didn't want to send it out on our letterhead. So in San Mateo County, the Office of Sustainability allowed us to send the invitation on their letterhead and in Los Banos the city of Los Banos allowed us to send the invitation on their letterhead. We offered participation incentives. Uh, we had a sweepstakes where there were two winners of $500 and 20 winners of $100. It was an online survey that was administered either in English or Spanish. And this was completed in May of this year. Um, respondents had to be an adult resident but could not be an employee or any of you. Uh, or members of any other energy companies. The total sample size is listed here in San Mateo County is 1,326 and 938 in Los Banos. Um, next slide, please. So this is a, um, a construct that um, our market research firm, Heider and Partners uses. And it's really, it's called a persuasion monitor. And it deconstructs the different stages of persuasion to look at where could improvements be made? Uh, it's kind of a funnel metrics or waterfall um, concept in which each subsequent stage of the funnel is dependent on the preceding stage. So for example, customers typically become aware before they are familiar. 
Uh, and then they usually reg register their favorability after they've already been familiar, that sort of thing. It doesn't always follow this kind of a slope, but um, it typically is something similar to this. So if you look at the differences between each stage of these metrics, it helps us to see where our messaging and marketing is on track and where improvements can be made. So for example, if we saw a huge drop off from like 80% aware to 40% familiar, this would indicate that our messages are not resonating with the residents. And if there were a big drop off between familiar and favorability, that could be a real problem because it could indicate that customers maybe don't trust our messages, don't believe our claims, or you know, they, judge us, they judge us unfavorably in general. So let's look at what this looks like uh, for Peninsula Clean Energy's brand. Next slide, please. So I'm showing here on this slide, um, the current San Mateo County only results compared to past surveys. And I'm very pleased to say that every place where you see these green arrows going up, this is where there's a statistically significant difference um, between the 2022 figures and earlier years. And so we have seen an increase above 40% in total awareness um, in San Mateo County for the first time in the years that we've been doing the study. And we've been doing this for, this is probably the fifth year now that we've done this. Um, so that's very good. Um, we're encouraged by that. However, we still have a ways to go to reach that 2025 target that you saw on that first slide. And you'll see again in a few minutes, and that target is 60% awareness. Um, but we now uh, have actually almost two years of regular email communications out to our approximately 200,000 customers for whom we have email addresses. This is a great uh, step forward because until we had the Granicus Gov delivery platform, we were not able to email all of our customers. Now we're uh, uh, treated as a government agency, which we are. Um, we're treated, uh, we're able to have white lists and we're able to send emails to all of those customers. So that's one thing. We've also been running a steady paid search campaign about uh, primarily around EVs. We've been doing that for about a year, um, a year and a half, I'm sorry, before the survey. And that's in addition to all the work that we do in our community relations through our community outreach partners, uh, through sponsorships, social media, and other types of earned media. So the drop off between the aware and familiar, those two sets of bars on the left is not very large, it's not a cliff. Um, and similarly, there is not a big drop off between familiar and favorable. So um, this would suggest that one of the things that we need to be focusing on is lifting all these boats, if you will, by increasing our awareness. And I, I found it interesting to note that in the DEAI presentation, one of the things that was mentioned was the idea that we ought to be expanding our channels and doing more TV and radio, and that would certainly help overall awareness as well. So interesting confluence of factors here. Um, so next slide, please. Now, looking at a comparison between San Mateo County and Los Banos um, is very interesting because, of course, uh, as we might expect in a very new territory, all these red arrows, by the way, are significant, indicate statistically significant differences between the San Mateo and Los Banos numbers, and you probably don't even need them because there is such a dramatic difference. Um, they, um, the 6% uh, uh, unaided awareness, which is that lightly shaded part of the bar on the left, I, I didn't mention that on the previous slide, my apologies, but 6% is unaided and the total of 14% is aided plus unaided that 6% actually compares favorably to where we were in unaided awareness in San Mateo County when we did our first enrollment back in 2016. So that's, that's all looking pretty good. And the, the trend of uh, relative measures here on aware, familiar, favorable, et cetera, is pretty good. Um, these persuasion metrics, this general uh, you know, set of metrics around awareness and familiarity and so on, uh, they do vary a bit across different demographic groups. They are stronger among uh, the 55 and older age group. They're stronger among homeowners and they're stronger among residents who live in single family dwellings. Um, interestingly, when comparing white versus Hispanic respondents where we've seen some differences in the past, the results are virtually identical. Um, we also took a look at uh, how Pen Peninsula Clean Energy is perceived 
in order to understand how well our key messages are coming across. So on the next slide, these are some of the, um, if you can move to the next slide, please. Um, this, these show some of the measures that we have uh, taken with the, with the respondents. So we asked them for each statement, please indicate if you think it is true or false about Peninsula Clean Energy. We also allowed them to respond, not sure. So for example, uh, I haven't shown all the not sures here, um, just because 29% in San Mateo said that it were a not-for-profit public agency, that doesn't mean that the balance of 71% thinks that's a false statement. The majority is, is basically not sure. Um, so as you can see here from the legend, uh, San Mateo is shown in green, Los Banos is shown in blue. Um, these, these comparisons between San Mateo and Los Banos on all of these measures, like is working to improve the environment, provides cleaner energy, offers programs that benefit the environment. They're really strikingly similar in terms of um, their, their relationships to one another um, and the importance ratings. The big difference is, the, is in this one area of is, is, not, is a not-for-profit public agency. That's on the measures I'm showing on this slide. You're gonna see some things on the next slide that are different as well. Um, what's really encouraging about this is that um, in San Mateo County, strong majorities, 59, 62, 66% on those top three factors of working to improve the environment, cleaner energy, greener programs, et cetera, uh, are strong majorities uh, believe that those are true about Peninsula Clean Energy. Um, next slide, please. So here's, here's one of the big differences, and that is that uh, of those who are aware of Peninsula Clean Energy, in Los Banos, 42% believe that we charge lower rates than PG&E. And that's actually a good reflection of the messaging that we have been emphasizing in Los Banos, which has been to lead with the idea that, you know, stay with Peninsula Clean Energy because we're gonna uh, charge lower rates than PG&E. So next slide. When we look at our strategic dashboard, then what you see for the blended territory across San Mateo and Los Banos in fiscal 22, as you see there on the, on the third column from the left, is that the aided awareness is 39% blended and the favorability is 57%. We still have a ways to go to get to our 2025 20, target. Uh, and I believe that we'll, uh, if we can increase awareness, we will be lifting up all these other metrics at the same time. So uh, I'm gonna pause there for a minute to see if there are any questions or comments, and then I'll go on to talking about some of the resident priorities. Okay, does anybody have a question or a comment? I don't see any questions or comments, KJ. Okay. So uh, let's move on to that. You'll have more, more opportunities. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, so this slide is a rather complicated slide and it shows resident priorities. And the question here was we asked, um, we provided the respondents a list of priorities that they could select from. And we asked them to rank their one, two and three priorities. So the darkest colors here, the darkest green and the darkest blue show the percentage of respondents who rated that particular attribute as the top priority. The middle colored blue, the, the medium shade or medium shades green or blue is the second priority and the lighter shade is the third priority. So these bars show all three of the top three priorities. And the arrows once again show statistical significant differences that are statistically significant between those measures in Los Banos and those measures in San Mateo. As we've seen in the previous years, the um, lower electric rates is the top uh, priority that people want from their energy provider, their electricity provider, that's the top priority that they want. Um, but they also want cleaner energy resources. You can see the 51% in San Mateo County and 42% in Los Banos. Um, they want solar plus storage solutions to provide electricity during power shutoffs. Um, so I think there's a, a tremendous amount of commonality here. There are some differences um, in, the, uh, in the strength of some of these measures. 
Um, I also will note that um, the offers programs that promote electric or EV, electric vehicles or EVs is 24% in San Mateo County. And this is a jump from the preceding year. I don't have the preceding year right at my fingertips, but um, I think that uh, the, um, I think these relative priorities in San Mateo County have been similar to past surveys, except for that issue. Oh, I do have the data on, on uh, last year. Last year, 17% of San Mateo County residents said they valued first, second, or third priority um, uh, an electricity provider that offers programs that promote electric vehicles or EVs. So there's a, there's a momentum behind EVs and there's a desire for continued support of EV purchases. So next slide, please. We also wanted to understand um, how uh, residents in San Mateo and in Los Banos um, perceived climate change because it's a piece of the messages that we're getting out, that we're putting out there. And it's also a piece of the mission that we, um, that we have for our agency. So we asked the question based on current trends, how much impact will climate change have on the everyday lifestyle of the next generation of San Mateo County residents or for Los Banos, the next generation of Los Banos residents? And you can see that a very large percentage in San Mateo County expect a, an extreme or substantial impact. So that looks to me like that's about two thirds of the, of the um, San Mateo County residents who believe that will have a substantial or extreme impact. When you look at Los Banos, over half still believe those that it will have a substantial or extreme impact. So 30% say substantial impact, 21% say extreme impact. So it's still a pretty significant um, issue for um, residents in both, uh, both parts of our territory. I think we, we tend to think that San Mateo County is much more concerned, and it is true, San Mateo County is much more concerned, but it is not true that residents in Los Banos are not concerned. They are, a good portion of them do believe there will be an impact. Um, next slide, please. Wait, KJ, I have a question. On that, on that last slide, when you look at the totals, Los Banos adds up to 100%, but San Mateo County adds up to something like only 80%. I'll have to go, that's a good point, uh, Rick. I'll have to go back and look and see if we've got some error in this data. Um, yeah, that, that seems Or awesome. if we're missing some, some number there. And thanks for pointing that out. Um, Okay, yeah, yeah. Should have added that up myself before putting this on here. So I'm red in the face. I will check that out, Rick, and, and get back to you. Great, no problem. Next slide, please. So um, then we ask about, this is really a question that's about um, agency or willing to act, willingness to act. So um, we, um, we asked people how much they agreed or disagreed with each of these kinds of statements. We asked this on a scale of one to 10. So if you uh, selected eight, nine, or 10 on this, uh, on this scale, uh, meaning on the level of importance or level of agreement, I'm sorry, level of agreement, um, you're included in these percentages. So in other words, 48% of the respondents in San Mateo County agreed eight, nine, or 10 on a scale of 10 that the actions I take in my home can have a meaningful, meaningful impact on climate change. 42% in Los Banos. Um, we have a third of the San Mateo respondents indicating that they are willing to pay up to 10% more to purchase products that would mitigate climate change. 37% uh, are willing to replace their vehicle or appliances before the end of their useful life. And only 14% would say they're not willing to pay anything more to purchase products that mitigate climate change. This is very important because some of the work that we're gonna be doing around encouraging electrification and encouraging people to move off of gas appliances through our programs and also through just general inspiration and, and encouragement is gonna rely on the willingness of our customers to take these actions to sometimes pay a little bit more and also to replace things before they have ended their useful lives. Uh, you can see the pattern in Los Banos where 42% believe that they can take ac actions they take in their home would have a meaningful impact. 
Um, there are significant differences in terms of willingness to replace uh, vehicles or appliances that's much less likely in most panels to be a message that's well received. Um, so uh, I think that's a, a pretty interesting set of contrasting attitudes. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, well, that, that moves us into the whole second piece of the presentation. So I'm gonna stop there before I go into the electrification messaging work and see if there are any other comments or questions um, on, on this so far. Uh, yeah, I've got a couple questions. Uh, Dave Pine, then for Deep. Um, thanks. I was a little confused about the PC favorability um, mm -hmm. number. Mm -hmm. I think you said it was 57%. Mm -hmm. I mean, does that suggest that 43% are somehow dissatisfied? Uh, there's actually was a change in people who were not sure that was piece that was a piece of it. Um, let me see if I can dig up that data in my notes here. Anyway, just overall, it seemed to be It seems what, Dave? I'm sorry. It seems, it seems I would expect it to be higher. It seems the the fifty seven percent seems. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. To me, it, I would have expected it to be higher. You would expect it to be higher. Yeah, could we go back to that slide? Um, it's a couple of slides ago, Shana. It's the that's the one I'm looking for. Okay, so we've we've had favorability percentage of people who were um, uh, aware who viewed things favorably. In the past, has been around you know 63 percent, 60 61 percent um, in previous years, and this year um, it dropped because there was partly there was an increase in ratings of not sure for for San Mateo. Oh no, for I think it was just San Mateo County from 33 percent not sure to 35 percent not sure. So that was a piece of it was the people who responded not sure, and there was a drop. From, or there was an increase in, in somewhat unfavorable from 3% to 6%. So the combination of more people not being sure, more respondents not being sure, and some uh, small percentage being less favorable is what resulted in that difference between the 61 and the 57%. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Pradeep. Uh, thank you, Rick. Uh, Karen, I, uh, there's a lot of data to absorb and uh, uh, get uh, it inside my head to comprehend all the implications. But uh, one uh, contradiction sort of thing came uh, pretty uh, obvious to me, and I wanted to check about your reaction to that. Uh, the contradiction I thought was that when you showed us the awareness uh, Twenty-four percent of San Mateo County customers were aware that we are lower than PG&E rates. Twenty-four percent. But then on the priority table, forty-nine percent of the San Mateo uh, folks thought that their highest priority is the rate being lower. And I wondered what about those. 24% and remaining 49%, uh, they were not aware uh, that they are getting lower rates than pg and &E. uh, I'm just trying to, I was a little confused. Please clarify that. Yeah, this is, this is a great question, Pradeep, and one that we debate internally a lot um, because when people respond to what is your highest priority for an electricity provider, they're thinking in general about their bills. This is Part, this is, I'm partly going out on a limb because it's partly my view of how they're seeing things. Um, but they're talking about my bills are going up. And a lot of our customers are looking at their bills month to month and seeing them go up. And what they want is lower bills. And if you take a look, and, and I've talked with Leslie about this in the past, and we've looked at sort of a typical bill that comes from PG&E, which includes a component that's gas. If you got the gas in there, you've got the transmission and distribution and the generation for a typical home, a residential customer, it looks like about 30% of the bill is generation. And if we're 5% less on that 30% than PG&E, that's one and a half percent on a bill. 
for a lot of our customers, those in San Mateo County, it's maybe two or three dollars savings a month versus if they were with PG&E. And for Los Banos, it's going to be a little bit different because the profile of usage there is very different. Um, but I think the um, the issue is that people don't want to spend two hundred and fifty dollars a month. They want to spend two hundred, or they don't want to spend five hundred. They want to spend three hundred. It's not the one and a half percent, couple of dollars. This is what I believe is going on with people. They're talking about what did they want from an electricity provider? They want lower, they want lower energy costs. They're not doing the, the comparison between PG&E and Peninsula Clean Energy on a regular basis once they've already been with one of those providers or the other. Thank you. Uh, Betsy. Thank you. Looking at the climate change attitudes, the um, slide, it seems to me that um, some of the responses may be due to a person's financial situation and that they're um, not willing to replace a vehicle or pay more because of their financial situation, not that they might not want to do that had, you know, if her finances were not an issue. I think that's absolutely correct. Um, Betsy, that's absolutely correct. And in Los Banos, the demographics are different than in San Mateo County, I believe, and, and Leslie can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe 50% of our residential customers in Los Banos are on care or fair rates. So that definitely comes into play. Thank you. Yeah, I don't, I don't have the exact figure off the top of my head, but it is uh, much higher um, at that level. KJ, you're correct. Thank you. Uh, KJ, the, the thing that really jumps out at me is if the slide before this one that you were showing, uh, no, uh, maybe it wasn't the immediate slide, but it was the one you had put up before that shows, yeah, the, the amount of awareness is significantly below our target. The favorability is somewhat below our target. It's, I, I am 100% certain that the awareness is largely a factor of people receiving a bill from PG&E and us being hidden within that bill. So my question is, and I, I you know, we've now been at this for uh, what? We, we, we've been at it for seven years, I think, uh, uh, since, since we first launched and, um, I'm just wondering if there's any option in the future for us to be able to separate our billing from PG&E's billing, because that's going to change the awareness line dramatically. And it probably will change the favorability line because it'll give us a more direct contact to our customers than having to send out separate emails from the bill. So I, I do think, Rick, uh, that last part of what you said is that if we raise up the awareness, we're gonna raise up the favorability because I think these are gonna lift up together. Um, as far as the, um, the aided awareness and the bill, certainly a lot of people don't know that we're, that we're serving them because they're not getting a bill from us. But with the ability of, to send out these emails, the gov delivery emails from Granicus, um, one of the things we've been able to do is, is help to increase the aided awareness. Um, and we've done a whole bunch of other things, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but we start those out by saying, dear Peninsula Clean Energy customer, you know, so we're kind of, you know, starting to do that. We're going to step up the level, the uh, frequency of those emails, um, because we haven't been sending them very often and we don't receive, we don't get a lot of opt outs. So there's not a lot of downside risk to more frequently reaching our customers. So that's one thing. The other thing is um, we know that at least one of our sister CCAs has been able to accelerate their aided awareness much higher than what we have. And, um, uh, and they have not been sending out a separate bill either. So there are some other things that we can be doing um, to step up the awareness that don't involve um, the, the fact that, that we're not sending people a bill but it does mean we need to make a bigger investment in that. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions? Oh, yes, I, I have a couple. Uh, Leslie, you have your hand up? 
I, I did. Yeah, I just wanted to um, have a comment about the, the separate bill um, item. Uh, right now, uh, the way that the uh, sort of legislation works and the authority or the authorization for CCAs to operate is uh, the IOUs have to be the billing agent for the CCAs. Um, so there would have to be, you know, like a legislative change, you know, for that to happen. Um, it, it's not actually one I would suggest that we advocate for, though, for a lot of reasons. Um, uh, one being, in general, customers don't want to necessarily get more bills. <laughs> um, they don't want to get a, they don't want to get another bill, <laughs> and it it probably would, you know, result in triggering some some level of opt out just for uh, simplicity's sake of people just wanting to go back to having one energy bill and not having two energy bills from, you know, two energy providers, um, but you know, I'll, I'll stop there. We can discuss more offline if you have other questions. Uh, no, that's good. Good comments. Uh, Colleen. Yes, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say I, I, I agree with uh, a lot of what Rick was trying to say. And, and I ask people all the time if they're aware of Peninsula Clean Energy and they'll say, well, yes. I, I don't think that they understand it's a community energy provider. And I think that point could be one of our strongest selling points because there is such a anti-corporate mentality on energy right now. And if, if people who are looking at a couple dollars one way or the other, and we know PG&E has some very strong um, salespeople on the phone, I'm told, who say that if you're with PCE, you're paying more. And they tell them that. I've, I've had neighbors tell me that. Um, I think if we can try to, to emphasize that this is an investment in a community power company. And also the other concern sometimes that I have heard is a confidence level. Are, are we just a small company? So if there's outages, they're not going to have power. And with PG&E, they know they can depend on picking up the phone and calling them and getting power restored. There, there's a, a real ambiguity in there that people don't understand the difference between the generation and the transmission. And I don't think we're effectively dealing with that to satisfy the confidence level. So if we can drive that home, that, that we are a community provider, we're not small, we've been around, we're very large now, and that, that we're getting bigger and that, that this is dollar for dollar a better investment if they're gonna have to pay for power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point that the community aspect is something that's very well received. One thing I didn't put in this presentation, but I do believe I put in the memo that it is in the board packet um, is comparison to PG&E's favorability rate. PG&E is viewed very unfavorably, especially in San Mateo County. So that's, that's one thing. By comparison, uh, we, we do look a lot better. The other thing is um, any concerns are not being reflected in the participation rate. As you can see, we have 97% participation rate. So um, it, people are not uh, so lacking in confidence that they're fleeing for the hills. That's, that's not happening at all. Okay, um, let me just see if there's any public comment. Uh, I don't see any public comment. Uh, KJ, why don't you go uh, on? To the, uh, go Rick, ahead. Rick, sorry, if I could just really quickly. Yeah, sure. I just wanted to uh, address uh, Director Macon's uh, comment about uh, pg &E, um, with a sort of a heavy handed sales tactic. Um, that is actually uh, not allowed um, per the uh, code of conduct with, P with the IOUs and the CCAs. If you have any direct knowledge, like you have uh, people that report that to you, that they've had that encounter, um, it would be really helpful if you would, you can either report it to us, they can report it to us, um, we can track that down. Um, so if they've had a phone call with pg &E, if we know the person that had that call, uh, we report that to pg &E. they do follow up on it. Um, nine times out of 10, it doesn't actually end up being um, a violation or issue, but we actually did have one um, on an, this last week where we had a customer report to us that they said some misinformation from PG&E. We followed up from it uh, 
in pg e researched it, discovered that actually, yes, their CSR did give bad information. It was a new CSR. They weren't really well, well trained. Um, and pg e is filing their own um, code of conduct violation report with the CPUC. So this is a very, this is something that pg e does take seriously um, internally if they can track it down and we can uh, find an actual violation. So just to anyone here, um, if you do have members of the public that are reporting these issues to you, if you can ask them to actually contact us and report those um, to us, we can track them down and follow up on them. Great. Okay. Um, I don't see any other comments or public comments. So KJ, why don't you go on to the electrification messaging report? Right. Okay, so late last fall, we began developing a concept for a campaign that would inspire residents to electrify their transportation and their residences. And the idea is that we would encourage people to think about the benefits of switching out of fossil fuels and into that really clean electricity that we are providing for them. Um, and so the intention of the messaging for this campaign would be to provide an overarching you know, big tent uh, message about uh, our, you know, for our communications. And then under that, we would be talking about particular programs or advancing particular programs and promoting different initiatives. Um, so we would still continue to do that, but that would be part of a larger campaign. So we wanted to understand the customer perspective and what messages would resonate with customers. We didn't want to assume that we knew what motivates our customers. And so we started out uh, with um, a round of in-depth interviews where we conducted, ultimately we conducted 16 in-depth interviews, one-on-one. -on -one. These were 50-minute interviews over Zoom by a professional facilitator. And we talked about what is their decision process, particularly focusing on home electrification. What's the decision process? What do they value? What are their perceived benefits? You know, how do they perceive climate change and so on? These, were, these interviews were conducted in January and February. And from these interviews, we gathered a list of 32 different factors of importance that customers considered when they were making appliance and equipment decisions for their home. So next slide, please. So this is just a selection of those 32 factors that are grouped into categories that tended to have similar response patterns. So we took these, um, these 32 selection factors and we conducted an online survey by having these factors be one of the main inputs into that survey. So this was conducted among just San Mateo County customers and, it, and they were invited via email. And the purpose of that survey was to understand the relative importance of these different decision factor, factors. You know, what did customers value? We asked them to rate each of these 32 things on a scale of one to 10 in importance where, you know, nine or 10 or super important. Um, and we also wanted to understand if there were different segments of customers that would weight these types of factors differently. So um, the respondents were offered similar incentives to the ones that I described for the awareness survey. Uh, and we got about 1,100 customers responding to the survey. So when we looked across the results from the entire sample, we found um, the results, uh, we found that one particular group of factors was stood out as very, very important. And this was a little bit surprising to us. So the next slide, please. The group of factors that were um, of greatest importance across the entire sample, 45% of the respondents indicated that health and safety considerations would be rated a nine or a 10, 10 on a scale of one to 10. And so what they meant by that was they, they didn't want things that would explode in their house. They didn't want things that would leak in their house. They didn't want things that would have uh, contribute to bad air quality. And there are a bunch of other factors here, but what's clear is when you start to look at some of the different segments of customers, these things shake out slightly differently as to what's important and, and what's not necessarily as important to each segment. But the thing that is consistent across all of the segments is the desire to have appliances and equipment in the home that are healthful and are safe for your family. Next slide, please. So the other thing we did was um, our market research firm analyzed the results and was able to break uh, the respondents into segments, into these seven segments. 
Um, and uh, they show here in this pie chart, the percentage, the estimated percentage of the population that falls into each of these segments. And I wanna point out the deep greens where a lot of the staff at Peninsula Clean Energy would probably self-characterize as the deep greens, maybe even a large portion of our board members. So it's really good that we took a look outside of ourselves to understand what the general population was really interested in. So when we looked at all these segments, what we were trying to find is, can we find some messaging that would resonate across a significantly large chunk of the population, a grouping of, of segments? Uh, and could we find messages that were reasonably common across the segments that we would choose so that we could have this messaging um, that was general and broad and could be used on things like in our website uh, so that, um, you know, where we can't necessarily target very finely, we're, we're talking to a broad audience. So what kinds of messages could we have that would address a large segment of, of our, a large portion of our, um, of our uh, population? So those segments that are marked with the red asterisk that are in blue, um, those comprise about 57% of the, of the population. And you can add in the deep greens and then you'll, you'll get to about two thirds. The deep greens are really different. Uh, from, from the other groups in terms of their motivations and so on. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So we named these, these groups, these different, we put these different names on these segments. They're not, we're not gonna be using these in, in public communications, you know, for in, you know, outreach uh, efforts and so on. So we're not gonna say, hey, are you an unempowered pragmatist? Come here and get, that's not the purpose of these. It's just for us to understand these different groups. So what you see here on this table is those three segments, those three blue segments, and then also the deep green segments. And what I've pulled out here, and you can see the percentage of market is, is, market, uh, is listed there as well. What I pulled out here is some of the numbers in this and some of the factors in here that um, were important to these different segments. And the numbers in the cell represent the percentage of respondents in that segment who would rate that particular factor a nine or a 10 on a scale of one to 10. So for example, the home value protectors, if you look down at that protect add value row, add to the value of my home in the long run, 56% of them rated that as important. Um, but what you can see across this um, are the health and safety things are, those factors are important across all of these segments. They want appliances and equipment that are safer, that don't have a risk of explosion, that do not release unsafe emissions, that protect their home's indoor air quality. And that's fairly consistent across those, all the segments that we're looking at here. They're also interested in equipment and appliances that cost less to run for a typical year. In fact, this emerged as somewhat more important than what it costs up front. I mean, I wanna know what it's gonna cost me if I replace my water heater from gas to a heat pump water heater. Is it gonna cost me more to operate it? That's an important characteristic. Um, the home value protectors are the one segment and that's why we called them home value protectors that really cared about things like um, add to the value of their home in the long run. Uh, and then this, this issue of climate friendliness, um, where uh, people are making decisions about appliances and equipment in their home because they are considering whether it helps them to protect the environment for future generations or that they have fewer emissions. So you can see the dramatic difference on these deep greens where 94% of them want to make choices based upon the impact on future generations or want to make 90% want to make sure that they have no contribution to climate change. The, the un, unempowered pragmatists, and you'll, you'll see in a couple of slides here why we chose to call them unempowered pragmatists, only 11% of them rated these, these climate friendly factors as something that they would consider when choosing appliances and equipment in their home. So we became a little bit concerned about whether or not we could have climate friendly messaging in some of our, our messages and our campaign to encourage switching from fossil fuels to, to clean elect, electric appliances and, and transportation. Um, so we thought, are we gonna turn off these unempowered pragmatists, this, this group of, of our um, customers, if we start emphasizing things like that, are they gonna say, oh, psh, I, I don't trust these people because they're emphasizing something that doesn't seem important to me. So we looked at uh, a couple of other things. We looked at some environmental attitudes. So. Next slide, please. Um, so 
as you can see, um, this was a question where we said, based on current trends, how much impact will climate change have on the everyday lifestyle of the next generation of San Mateo County residents? This is similar to some of the questions that we had in the awareness survey. So you can see the home value protectors, the light greens, the deep greens, none of the, there were 0% who chose no impact. Very small percentage said a minor impact. When you look at the unempowered pragmatists, 25% thought that climate change would have no or a minor impact on the everyday lifestyle in the future. So we thought, oh, that, that's big. But if you look at the respondents who said extreme impact or substantial impact, under the unempowered pragmatist, you still have 40, 44% of those uh, people in that segment who feel that, it, that climate change will have a substantial or extreme impact um, on uh, the next generation. So we thought, okay, that provides us a little bit of comfort that using climate-friendly messaging is probably not going to be alienating uh, that group of, of uh, uh, that segment within our population. Um, next slide, please. And then um, the other thing that we looked at is, um, and this is why we ended up labeling this segment unempowered, we asked people, again, the, this same set of questions that you saw in the earlier slides, you know, do what is what you do in your home, does that have a meaningful, meaningful impact on climate change? And you can see the differences here in this segment of the unempowered pragmatists compared to say the home value protectors, the light greens, the deep greens, only, only a quarter of the unempowered pragmatists really feel that that can have an impact, uh, that, that actions that they take can have an impact on climate change. A smaller portion of them are willing to pay more um, for, uh, for products that mitigate climate change compared to the other groups. So um, when we look at this in combination with the fact that 44% of this group um, still believe that there could be a substantial extreme impact with climate change, we, we have a, we have some sense of comfort that we think this group can also be persuaded, but that what we might need to do is to talk about climate change as something that you kind of get free with purchase. Yeah, you want your you want healthy and safe environment in your home. You want things that are efficient. Um, and oh, by the way, it's better for the environment too. So that's kind of the direction that we're heading in. Um, next slide, please. Um, there were some differences across uh, demographics, and I'm not going to dwell on this in the interest of time. I will just point out that the deep greens are really different. They're older, whiter, richer, more likely to be homeowners than the other groups. And um, I don't think that that's going to necessarily drive um, a lot of our messaging. We do think there's an opportunity to more finely target the deep greens with a climate friendly forward message. So with that group, if you can target that group, you can start with climate friendly, but with the other groups, you don't start with climate friendly. It's a part of the mix. It's a, it's a part of what you say to them. Next slide, please. Um, so the implications for message development is that we need to emphasize health and safety benefits. Um, so we're gonna probably have to do some uh, education around uh, the, the negative impacts of methane gas combustion in the home. We're not gonna, we're not gonna strike a negative tone, but we are gonna um, probably have to do some education around that. Um, cost is an issue that we have to address, um, but it's a little different than, you know, the kind of straightforward message you can make about EVs right now, because EVs you can save from day one if you switch from a, a gas powered internal combustion engine to an electric vehicle, you save on maintenance, you save on fuel, especially with higher gas prices, um, et cetera. So it's a, it's, a, it's a different message there, but with home appliances and, and home electrification, we're gonna probably have to emphasize things like efficiency. And there are some examples where there's a cost savings, um, but I think for, the, for now, a lot of our messaging is gonna have to be around efficiency. And we may also be able to supplement our messages with case studies and appliance specific examples. And then climate-friendly messaging, of course, um, can resonate with most of our target segments. And, and as I mentioned, we'd have sort of a free with purchase um, uh, type of statement. It wouldn't be said that way, but it, it's that kind of mentality for the, um, for the unempowered pragmatists. Um, next slide, please. We have some challenges with message development. And what you see here on this, this uh, graph is some uh, research results from a study that we did in 2020, where we asked respondents to 
indicate if they thought it cost more to operate gas or electric appliances. It was a very general question. It wasn't about a clothes dryer or a stove or anything like that. But the perception here is that gas appliances cost less to operate. And the, the balance is not toward electric appliances cost, costing less to operate, but there's a big chunk that's not sure. And so we have a big opportunity there. Um, what we also found in our research, including in the, in the in-depth interviews is that general literacy about energy is, seems to be pretty low. A lot of people weren't aware whether their water heater was powered by gas or by electricity. Um, assumptions about having solar on your roof, meaning that you're, you don't have to worry about when the grid goes down. There, there's just a lot of um, lack of information uh, or lack of understanding, I should say. There's, it's, not, it's just low literacy on, on energy. There's low awareness of the effects of methane gas. We're going to have to change that. Um, and um, you know, as I mentioned, we like to increase the the favorability, um, the favorable perception and consideration of um, electric appliances. Next slide, please. So one of the things we've been doing with marketing is we have a great um, subcommittee of the board um, that's been working with us, Giselle and Laura and uh, uh, Diane Hawkins from uh, from uh, uh, Atherton have been helping us uh, shape some of this work. Um, and I wanna thank them for the time that they've spent with us on this. Um, we have some next steps that are, are, are underway. Um, we have a general campaign plan that's currently under review. We are about to start testing three specific themes. We're gonna be doing this in our owned media, including uh, things like on our homepage, uh, probably in some email testing and also in some social media. Um, and then we expect to uh, start a general campaign in the middle, of, middle to the end of next month. Um, and we will be collaborating. We've, we've been meeting with uh, some of our partners, the San Mateo County Office of Education, Bay Ren, some of our outreach partners. Um, we're also going to be doing a, um, an interesting pilot with a couple of building departments, um, probably Redwood City and also with Atherton, where we will provide information at the point of permit um, so that contractors and homeowners and other people who are pulling permits can get information about uh, gas versus electric appliances. So we're going to try that out and see how that works. Um, and then we'll be expanding the campaign beyond that. So next slide, please. So these are some creative concepts that we're considering that we're going to be testing out in these, in these uh, owned media, for example. One is uh, clear the air, go electric. Um, that kind of plays on the um, on the air pollution, the indoor air quality, it also uh, would work nicely with um, transportation electrification. A healthy climate starts at home, uh, accent on the healthy uh, part of things, and then healthy homes run electric. These are three that we're um, working on at this moment to, uh, to see what kind of response and what kind of engagement we can get with these different messages. So that's the end of what I wanted to say there. Would love to hear your input or any questions. Okay, any questions or comments from members of the board? Yeah, Rick, I'd like to just comment. Go ahead. I'd like to say that I really find this very encouraging. Uh, I think the data shows that we're heading in the right direction. We have some work to do, but uh, I feel uh, encouraged and um, I'm uh, positive about this. I really want to thank you, KJ, for the deep uh, uh, data that you've gathered. Uh, um, very skilled work. Thank you very much. And I look forward to, if there's anything I can do to help with this, I'd like to help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, Donna, then Laura, then Harvey. Um, thanks. Um, also really interesting. Um, I, I think another interesting element of this is the um, kind of parallels to the conversations we're having around the county on sea level rise and sort of the questioning and vetting of that, like how much would you be interested in investing, paying, how much cost would you be able, and they, they really link, right? The worst climate situation we get, the worst sea level rise gets or the more expedited it is, and they really link. So I'm kind of wondering, KJ, if maybe um, as the county and cities reach out to do work around that, um, 
if it's if it's not worth at least just looking at their data and kind of thinking about them a little bit together um, because it is kind of a holistic conversation and um, and people all talk about climate change. They talk about wanting to fight climate change, but when the rubber hits the road and you tell them the cost, that is where I find people have a tendency just to say, well, I'm really want it to be that way, but I don't want to pay anything. And I think there was a federal study done and it was like, the average homeowner or the average person in America has to pay something like $127 a year just to deal with climate change um, and all the work we need to do to get ready. And when they interviewed people, the response was I'm willing to pay $22 to do that. So you can see there's just sort of a gap between what people want and what they're willing to pay for. And mm -hmm. I think part of what we're going to have to really do here is figure out how to get people to understand the value in in, in these shorter term and midterm investments for the long term. So good luck with that. It's gonna, it's, you know, like Rick says, you're going in the right direction. Thank you. Okay, Laura. Great, thank you. I just wanted to thank KJ and her, and her team for such a thorough job um, on this effort. Um, the opportunity to identify segments within the community as well as key insights. So as to enable the, uh, uh, team to uh, figure out how to communicate the value that Peninsula Clean Energy brings to the um, table, literally, um, as well as um, inspiring action among community members and really making that connection. I think that um, uh, Vice Chair uh, Colson is talking about, which is, you know, how can we each take a step towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, is uh, really imperative. And so I think this is uh, well on the way uh, towards that eventuality. And I just wanted to thank KJ and the team uh, for their hard work here. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Laura. Harvey. I just want to give a little real world uh, example. Um, we in Half Moon Bay had a, a really good electrification ordinance on the table uh, that would require uh, burnout of uh, existing uh, um, methane appliances uh, to be electrified. And the, the pushback from the, the, uh, the, the populace was amazingly negative. So the, the almost uh, universal complaint uh, was that it costs too much. So I really think that the, the idea of the upfront costs uh, uh, needs to be addressed. I'm not sure exactly how to do it the best way, but I'm just saying that if, if Half Moon Bay is any sort of example of what kind of resistance you're gonna get to doing real electrification of existing buildings, uh, you should start with some messaging that uh, talks about the cost uh, and the future costs and, uh, and this health and safety really uh, didn't go over big, but it, it, it's, a, it's a real thing that ought to be uh, emphasized, uh, especially the, the dangers of uh, internal uh, uh, air pollution. So that's my two cents. I'm sorry to be a downer, but this is what we learned. So thank you. Uh, I, if I could just respond to that, I, and thank you, Harley, for that. I, I do think we're going to be needing still incentives and rebates uh, and that sort of thing. And, and obviously, Raphael and his team is working very hard on the 2035 decarbonization plan and looking at, you know, how do we uh, enable that with other types of incentives and so on. So, so we definitely, uh, definitely need to look at that, too. Thank you. You're right. Uh, KJ, I, I, I want to thank you also for the presentation and, and the in-depth nature of the information. It's really valuable to us to get the perspective. I and mean, the thing that totally jumps out is how important the health and safety issue is and how much that rises to the top for each of the different segments uh, that you segregated. Um, and you know, 
I'm looking at the messaging and I understand the value of being positive and not being negative. Uh, so I think we'll see exactly how these messages play out. But my gut tells me that people are going to react more strongly when they're informed that methane gas hurts their health. And, and they're not gonna respond as strongly when they hear that, you know, they'll clear the air if they use electricity. I think they really need to hear that methane gas damages their health. That, that was the biggest and most impressive set of studies that we saw when we, when, uh, we looked at the studies of, of the different stoves of the electric versus the gas stoves. And, and I just think that that we're not going to truly move people until that information gets out more broadly. And I think it's only begun to get out. I think there's a long ways to go. So that is my comment. Yeah, I, if I could just add um, something there, Rick, and that's that um, we've been, um, we've begun engaging with physicians for social responsibility. Um, they uh, presented to a, a group of the kitchen electrification group of building decarbonization coalition and following that Kirsten and team have engaged with PSR physicians for social responsibility and they are beating the drum They're, They've nationally set a uh, resolution about the importance of swapping out gas stoves for um, electric appliances. Uh, and they are actually uh, marshalling an army of advocates of people who are medical professionals who can go to reach code consideration meetings at city councils and speak on behalf of the health and the public health risks of, of having gas appliances. So that's a, that's a really um, big step in this. I, I think it's really important. Oh, okay, Carlos and then Tiger, yes. Thank you. Um, KJ, is, is there any way to, well, are, yeah, can, can we look at the tabs in the survey that would potentially disaggregate um, the data by socioeconomic kind of range rank? I find it really interesting and I'm, I'm actually very glad that we have the comparative data with Los Baños, but I'd like to understand a little better, um, you know, what is the difference between let's say a daily city that has a lower median income or East Palo Alto, um, and and how do the message? How does the messaging that you're proposing? How might it not be as resident resonant with you know Los Baños folks or folks who are struggling more socioeconomically or economically? So is is there any way to disaggregate? You know, I I think you had an N of thirteen hundred. Is that right? Um, no, so, it was 1100 for the messaging um, and it was larger for the awareness and perception. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, and that's a good point, uh, Carlos. And, and um, one of the things that we did with this electrification messaging uh, research was we were looking, we, we did it just as an online an email invitation survey. It was pro the results of the sample were 23% uh, were renters, the remainder were homeowners. So it definitely tilted toward homeowners and the messaging that we're talking about, a lot of the messaging we're talking about for, for um, building electrification is intended to be targeted to decision makers. So we have a, a different um, set of messages that we're gonna need to um, uh, target for renters, for example. And the intersection between home ownership and low income is very low in our county. So. There, there's some differences there demographically, just by nature of who's who's uh, who's able to afford a home to buy a home. So, thank you. I I didn't realize, and maybe I missed it in the report that it was a it was a seventy five percent homeowners, you know, around twenty five renters, which I think certainly makes a makes a difference. Thank you. Appreciate it. Right. Okay, Tiger Joes. Thank you, Chair, and. Uh, Thank you, KJ. I just wanted to echo a little bit and elaborate a little bit. And um, it, it, it's um, what makes this study so impressive to me is first seeing everything that goes in on the back end 
and then seeing the simplicity that comes out on the front end. And while I'm suddenly very excited for the messaging that PCE will be able to offer, I think I'm even a little bit more excited that like um, personally, I'm usually focused on the climate change. That's the pressing issue. And what this obviated to me was, oh yeah, I'm constantly surrounded by a volatile substance that at any given point is poisoning me. And I'm always so concerned about the big picture that I forget that, that immediate reality. And that's the value of this study to me. So that now when I report out to my council about this meeting, and what I learned, as I do on a monthly basis, I'm able to immediately bring that message because I was reminded of something I already knew but don't usually think about, as I would imagine others, um, kind of to Chair de Golia's point, um, it, it's kind of, it's not necessarily a negative um, messaging so much as it is a reminder of what maybe you don't always have awareness of at any given moment. And so is it negative if you're just reminding people of what they forgot? So again, thank you. It's really a rather powerful study. Thanks. Okay, great, thank you. I, I don't see any other comments from the board. Is there any public comment? Uh, Jason. Hi, I really quickly, I think that, and we discussed this in the Citizens Advisory Committee, and I think that KJ's study is so unbelievably powerful as a tool for all of us. But I did want to bring up, which I brought up then, that in addition to the obvious financial costs, one of the big things that happened as a guinea pig for this last year in electrifying everything was the costs associated with the ignorance of the contractors, the homeowners, and everybody else, and the difficulty of getting through doing these electrification programs when it comes to all the things that come up that you don't think about. And I think PCE is incredibly uniquely situated to sort of be the facilitator and the handholder there. And I think it's important that that be part of the planning with the marketing and on the back end, because even just having a checklist of things to make sure people are able to do at all the different levels would be incredibly useful and helpful because that cost is one that we don't, we can't really account for often. And it's the, one of the biggest things is just making sure you know what's going on and how to do these things. So I just wanted to share that now like we did before. Thank you. Great, okay. Um, I don't see any other public comment. Uh, thank you very much, KJ, for the report. Wait, did I just see someone's hand go up? Uh, yeah, Jan? That was me, yeah. <laughs> before, you, before you go on to the next thing. Yeah, I just wanted to, to thank KJ and I know a lot of people recognize this, but we're really lucky to have KJ on our on our team here because she's an expert in marketing. And um, as you could see by the study, a lot of really helpful insights. And so thank you, KJ and team for the great work that you're doing for us. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, so the last item on the agenda is board members reports. Does anyone have a report? Okay, I don't see any reports. Thank you everyone for coming uh, to and a half hour meeting. We got a lot of information tonight. Uh, we will see you at, at the August meeting, which will start at 5.30, right, Jan? No? No, August is our regular time, 6.30. Yeah, okay, yes. so plan on 6.30 uh, in August, and we'll start an hour early in September. And that, and we won't do a Saturday meeting in September. Exactly. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.